Before Generals Petraeus and McChrystal, there was another U.S. general that captured America's attention. He was the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe during the war in Kosovo. In 2004, he ran for the Democratic nomination for president. And in 2008, he was rumored to be on Hillary Clinton's shortlist for vice president. Today, he continues to be an influential voice in U.S. politics and national security issues. His name is General Wesley Clark, and he sat down with fault lines to discuss war, politics, and corn. We're not causing trouble. We're general Clark was certainly never an armchair general. They're a power that's trying to... A graduate of West Point, he went on to serve in Vietnam, where he was shot four times by a Viet Cong soldier. But it was the war in Kosovo that made him a public figure, and which led to his failed presidential bid a few years later. Now based in Little Rock, Arkansas, he's retreated somewhat from the spotlight of frontline politics, and has found a new calling and a new job as a front man for the ethanol industry. How do you go from being a general to uh, promoting ethanol? Well, first of all, I had an engineering background. Um, in fact, uh, my last engineering course at West Point was nuclear engineering, so I studied all about nuclear power. Much of the world's instability today seems to revolve around oil. If you look at the war in Iraq, if you look at the war, like uh, instability in Nigeria, if you look at what's happening in the Gulf right now with the Deepwater Horizon, it seems to be the implications of America's relationship with oil. Maybe not just the U.S. Well, relationship. We must have but seen our ads on ethanol, where we these little ads. We got a two and a half. I, I haven't actually. Two and a half million dollar advertising campaign. It's it's heavy in Washington D.C. and some other places. It says, you know, it's green shows uh, an ear of corn and a little drop of ethanol. It says, no beaches have ever been ruined by ethanol. No wars have ever been fought for ethanol. Well, how many wars and, and, and how many disasters like Deepwater Horizon do you think it's going to take before America is willing to change its, and make lifestyle changes to, to something oh, other than oil? I don't think you have to make any lifestyle changes on this. It's not about lifestyle changes. It's just about the way the system works. You know, in the, the ethanol, ethanol is an alternative liquid fuel. Now, you can't produce it right now and totally substitute for oil, not even for imported oil, not even for OPEC-sourced oil. Mm -hmm. There's not enough corn, and making it from cellulose requires a couple of intermediate steps with enzymes that add to the cost, and so it's not competitive. Corn-based ethanol is maybe 10 to 20 percent cheaper per gallon than gasoline is at today's price. Well, the, the National Academy of Sciences, though, said that it's actually uh, non-climate related damages for corn grain ethanol were similar or slightly worse than gasoline because of the energy needed to produce the corn and convert it to fuel. And that, that was last year from the National Academy of Sciences. Actually, that's based on obsolete data. If you look at what's happening in the ethanol industry, every year it gets more efficient. If you produce oil, it's a wonderful thing. If you don't produce oil and you're a developing country and you have to use your hard-won foreign exchange to import oil, wouldn't it be wonderful if you could just plant something and on your own soil make the liquid fuel you need for agriculture and transportation? And it can be done. Well, you can't talk about oil right now without talking about what's happening in, in the Gulf. How do you think the Obama administration is handling the oil spill in the Gulf? Well, you know, it's BP's responsibility in the first place, by law. Mm. And, uh, and BP has the responsibility and the technology to do something about, about it. Um, the U.S. Navy's not prepared to conduct drilling operations or anti com or counter drilling operations at 5,000 feet below sea level for a very good reason. I mean, that's, that's not our national security interests, at least it hasn't been in the past. Mm -hmm. So it is BP's responsibility. As far as the cleanup's concerned, I'm glad to see that we're taking a, putting a different structure in place and we're getting the resources out and so forth. Do you um, think it's appropriate that the Pentagon has continued to issue billion dollar contracts to BP for more oil and gas from them? Well, I think that you know the Pentagon has got its own needs for fuel and I think that really the two events are pretty much unrelated. 
I know there are people out there pressing to end all and finish off BP and so forth. You know, I, I don't want to look at it in moral terms. I want to look at it in terms of technical terms, economic terms, ecological terms. Uh, BP put its corporate processes at work. It's trying to seal off the well. Those corporate processes may not be the best processes to deal with things like beach cleanup and others. And so we've got a different organization going in down. The Obama administration has taken much more direct responsibility for things like the beach cleanup and, and what to do with the consequences of it. So it I think that's kind appropriate. of beats the beast, though, doesn't it? The, uh, the, the Pentagon gives a billion dollar contract to BP. BP will need to drill more. And it doesn't seem that BP has a plan for what happens when something like deep water happens. Well, none or of if these, they have a plan, it's not a very good one. Right? Would have an easy time dealing with a well like this, and until the investigation is completed, there's going to be what we saw, which is a lot of finger pointing as people look and say, "Who's really? Why did the BOP not succeed? How come this wasn't done? Who was in charge?" There's a lot of missing information on this, and, and that's not clear yet. But BP doesn't only sell its own oil, it's, it's buying, it's, it's brokering, it, it's trading oil. So for the Pentagon to suddenly, you know, cancel a contract and have to let another contract, I don't see really the, the point of that other than to somehow punish BP as a corporation. I think BP's already experiencing corporate accountability in a very public and dramatic way right now. So I don't think it requires any additional effort by the Pentagon to to Talking bring about to bear. finger pointing in the Pentagon, what happened in Afghanistan recently with Gen General McChrystal? Uh, by all accounts of the military, everyone seemed to think that McChrystal was doing a good job in Afghanistan, and that he was competent and maybe the most capable leader. But because of comments in the press, uh, President Obama fired him. What do you think of that decision? Well, I think there's lines you can't cross, and uh, I think that when something like that comes out publicly and um, and it casts um, doubt on the relationship between civil authority and military authority, then civil authority has to act. So I think the president did what he had to do. Do you think that whole event was really emblematic of, between the struggle of the U.S. military being under civilian political control? No. I think that was an indication of what happens when you have unexpected, unanticipated encounters with the press. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting... Basically, from the standpoint of the military, and the government. There's no interest at all, no purpose in opening up internal attitudes and, and discussions to public view. It the seemed press like the things views, they said weren't new. The, every, every command level says those things about the next command level up, right? I mean, at the platoon level, you always bitch about the company commander not knowing what he's doing. Well, let's put it this way. It always is a tendency, but when you were at the platoon, platoon level, didn't your company commander say, now look, there's a lot of good guys up here working at company, I don't want to hear this, knock it off. And when you were at battalion level, you could hear the same rumblings, and your, when I was a battalion commander, I could hear my S3 come in and say, sir, you won't believe what Brigade just told us. Mm -hmm. But you know, there was a reason for it. Usually a higher headquarters doesn't know as much about your job as you do. If they do, you should be fired. But you don't know their perspectives either and what they're trying to balance off. You have to have respect going both ways. And it's up to the commander to maintain that atmosphere of respect in his command. It's also interesting that it was Rolling Stone that was following the general. I mean, Rolling Stone's in a magazine that, well, it, it's never been pro-military. It's actually generally against the military, but it's also known for profiling rock stars. Have generals entered this kind of era where you need to be a rock star? Well, look, I, I have no idea why he dealt with Rolling Stone. They have, they have a, a well-known approach. They do some fabulous investigative journalism on some issues. Um, but, you know, why he did that, how it happened, we'll have to wait and hear from General McChrystal. He'll tell us his story someday. But nonetheless, you think it was correct that Obama fired I don't him. think he had any choice. Uh, what do you think about the strategy in Afghanistan right now? And, and how does Petraeus change the, uh, the dynamic there? Yeah, well, it's, it's, a very, it's a very challenging situation. Strategy is like a chess game. Each game is unique. You may have some common pieces, you may have the same moves, but how you assemble it is different. So Iraq was different than Afghanistan, and nobody knows that better than Dave Petraeus. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think what, what I see 
in, in the Afghanistan issue is. It's mostly Pakistan. Mm -hmm. um, Al-Qaeda still has a base in the frontier territories. Uh, you can't pull out of Afghanistan and, um, and just leave and say, well, it's all Pakistan's problem. It isn't. Part of it is our problem. You can't get at the people in the frontier territories except by working with the Pakistanis. Um, they have their concerns in the region with Indian influence and what India is doing on their back, at their back door inside Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the Indians are concerned about what the Pakistanis are doing in Kashmir. And uh, both are nuclear powers. So there's a lot of dimensions of this beyond what happens in Kandahar or Marja. And uh, Dave understands those dimensions. I think, you know, he's better equipped than anybody at this time to handle it, to work the strategy and, and to pull some order out of the situation that's unfolding there. You know General Petraeus? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about his aspirations for the presidency one day? You think that's something he he dreams of or thinks I of? I have no idea. I've never discussed it with him. And it's I never come up. I don't speak for him. Yeah, but few people have been in his shoes. A four-star general who may get out and have be politically pulled into the the presidential race. I, you're one of the few people in the world right now that, that can say, I, I recognize the position that General Petraeus is in. And, and do you think those forces will draw him into an election? I just wouldn't want to speculate on something like that. I think it'd be unfair to General Petraeus. I think it'd be unfair to the administration that he's serving. I think it would be unfair to the soldiers who, and Marines whose lives depend on his decisions. <laughs>Nine years into the Afghanistan war, what kind of grade would you give the U.S. on it? Well, I, I was one of those who said that we should have gone to Afghanistan. I never had a problem with that. Um, I believed that when we went in there, we didn't do a good job of planning. We didn't really plan to get Osama bin Laden. We just planned to sort of drop some bombs and punish him. The Taliban fell apart. It was kind of a shock. Suddenly we were there, and then we tried to sort of minimalize it afterwards. So. We could have left entirely, and we could have gone in and stayed in a big way. We sort of straddled it and, and got it wrong, and we were there enough to provide an object of, um, of resistance to allow the Taliban to focus and reorganize and draw in resources, but we weren't there in sufficient strength and with the right support, um, economic political, diplomatic, as well as military, to actually finish the, the job that we started when we toppled the Taliban. When you have the political support to take strong military measures, you must do so. Mm -hmm. If you wait in extremis until you say, if we don't do this, we'll certainly fail, by that time, the public sees it as well, and you won't have the political support to do it. We need to be working much more effectively with the Pakistani military, whatever it takes. And, uh, and, and Dave Petraeus will know this, Mike Mullen knows this, Ambassador Holbrook knows this. Whatever it takes to get them going. Do they need attack helicopters? Get the attack helicopters there. Do they need better intelligence? Get them the intelligence. Can we work more cooperatively together? Put those teams together to do this. Don't let us be deterred. The, the war in Afghanistan is the war in the region, not just in Afghanistan. If we don't do something about the support, the base area coming out of Pakistan, we won't succeed in Afghanistan. Will it require boots on the ground there, U.S. boots on the ground? Well, we hope not. But that's the kind of call that General Petraeus has to make. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I think that it depends on how effectively we operate with the Pakistanis. And we haven't seen the limits of that effectiveness yet. Right now, it seems the U.S. is fighting that war mostly with drones, and you're a big supporter of unmanned aerial vehicles. How do you, uh, how effective do you think the drones are in, Very in the effective. war there? It, do you worry that they turn the, the Pakistani population against American and possible American operations? No, there? because both sides make mistakes in war, and um, the Taliban have made a huge mistake executing terror operations against the Pakistani populace. It was a huge, huge strategic blunder for the Pakistani Taliban to think they could get back at the Pakistanis by going after 
civilian targets and exploding bombs and killing innocent Pakistanis. But in, a, in an Al Jazeera survey in Pakistan, more Pakistanis believe the U.S. is a greater threat to them than the Taliban. Yes, but I think that's a, a lingering effect of a decade of a decade and a half of estrangement from Pakistan. I think the programs that are in place today and working today are going to change that public view, aided by the fact or assisted some way by the mistakes of the Taliban in Pakistan. Are you optimistic for a victory in Afghanistan? I, I think that when you look at this, that um, we've got to go against Al Qaeda. So I don't think the it's optimistic versus but pessimistic. Leon Panetta and General I Jones say Al Qaeda really isn't in I Afghanistan. That's right. They're in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So we've got to work this. Um, so I'm trying to imagine if you are, are you optimistic about a victory in Afghanistan? Well, I don't label things. I'm I'm a strategist. I'm looking at how you can do this. I've never met a general that doesn't believe in victory. I, I, do, I mean, to, to label things as, as victory or not seems pretty simplistic. Is, is that something that... I think that when you label things as victory, you've got to define what you mean by victory. Mm -hmm. You've got to cl be clear about what your objectives are. General Petraeus is, is actually linked what's happening in Afghanistan and Iraq and says that they, they won't be solved without essentially solving what's happening in Israel and Gaza, that they're, that they're all interrelated. What do you think of that view? Well, it's not just his view. I mean, everybody generally in the region says you've got to do something to bring it into the to the issue between Israel and the Palestinians. Well, there are major strategists today. I, I believe Anthony Cordesman CI, at CSIS is one of them that says that Israel has become a political liability, essentially a strategic, uh, I mean, yeah, strategic liability rather than asset to the U.S. Do, do you believe that the U.S. suffers internationally for its relationship with Israel? I believe that what the United States has to do is work uh, on a very complicated playing field in multiple areas of endeavor at the same time to bring these toward a successful conclusion. What would a successful conclusion look like think, in Israel? I think you can do several things. I think you need to de-weight the reliance on energy from the region. Mm -hmm. I think you need to uh, work with the local governments, not only Israel and the Palestinians, but all the governments in the region, to promote economic development, a sense of uh, justice, and, uh, and respect for the rule of law in the region. I think you've got to work to uh, end the struggle between India and Pakistan um, over issues uh, in the region. Uh, and in the context of ending that, I think you'll be able to uh, reduce forces in Afghanistan, even as you're dealing with the problem of al-Qaeda. Um, and I think you've got to promote uh, some movement in the, uh, in the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. And uh, I don't think it's a matter of solutions. I don't think it's, this is not the kind of thing that you can just sort of say, ah, divide up the map, uh, cut this line, work this, the problem will go away. These problems are embedded in the hearts and minds of people. They're not going to go away. But if you can stop the killing, if you can stop the, the desire to, to, to murder or to use terrorism or to bludgeon, um, then let the problems be argued for the next 100 years by diplomats. Let ordinary people go on with their lives, raise families, and have jobs, and earn a living. Back to Israel and the relationship with Iran. Uh, what's your view on the, the new sanctions against Iran? Would they be effective in stopping Iran from, from attaining nuclear weapons? And I ask you because your experience in North Korea seemed almost similar, if not parallel, to 10 or 15 years ago as to where the United States is now with Iran. I think that um, the Iranians are moving technically uh, uh, a little bit slower than, uh, than the worst case analysis has, has shown. Um, they're, they're in it for political power, not for military power. I think the sanctions can have an impact, uh, but ultimately a decision will probably have to be made at some point whether the sanctions are sufficient in and of themselves. Do you understand their desire to have nuclear weapons? I don't know what you mean by the word understand. In other words, if I were an Iranian, would I want nuclear weapons? No, absolutely I would not. Why would you want nuclear weapons? Why would you want to do something that puts you at odds with the greatest powers in the world? Maybe because Israel has them, because the U.S. has them, and they're in Iraq and Afghanistan on both sides. I think it's China, Pakistan, India are all in that region, and they all have them. Why about, shouldn't Iran? I think it's basically about Iranian internal politics. I think, you know, you can construct a rational argument 
from as you're trying to do, but uh, when you probe that argument a little bit deeper, it breaks down. If you were really interested in the good of the Iranian people, why would you want nuclear weapons? Why wouldn't you want good relations with every country in the world? Why would you want to pick a fight with other nations? Israel doesn't have anything, any harm intended against Iran. Why would you want to fight with uh, a technologically advanced and innovative Israel? It, it can only be about the, uh, the, the wellsprings of political power inside Iran. And, um, you know, people create these arguments to serve their own political interests. So, no, I don't understand, and I don't believe there's a real case for Iran to have nuclear weapons at all. Well, even with the North Koreans, although you called them graceless and, and hard-headed in their negotiations, you said you understood that they that they were fearful and felt like they were surrounded and they they needed this for self-defense. Oh. It seems like the argument applies to Iran. It doesn't apply to Iran. It doesn't apply the way you're applying it to um, Korea, to North Korea. Um, you have to be able to uh, evaluate the motives of your negotiating adversaries. Okay, so. That's their motives. That doesn't mean that I, quote, understand them. I don't understand anything in those terms about the North Korean regime because, after all, how can you have a regime that um, is so determined to survive at the cost of the people who live under it, that it destroys their lives? It, that, that it's actually made them physically smaller. You know, when you go to North Korea, the average North Korean is several inches and. 20 pounds smaller than the average South Korean. Well, this wasn't the case 60 years ago. This is just a matter of malnutrition. How can you have any understanding for a regime that does that? You can see, okay, you understand that they're trying to survive, but you don't really understand it because it doesn't really make sense. There's no rational case for this. Mm -hmm. There's only selfishness and the personal interests of the people in power, and that's exactly the case with Iran. In 2007, you said you, you think about running for the presidency every day, quote in Politico. Do you still think about it? Well, I'm really happy we've got a great leadership team in the United States. Do you still think about running for the no, presidency? I'm happy with the leadership team in the United States. I'm mostly in the business sector.